Well, we are in Mark chapter 2. We're picking up here in verse 1 as Jesus continues His ministry. And so in verses 1 through 12 uh, is our text this evening. And when He returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that He was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And He was preaching the Word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, "'Son, your sins are forgiven.'" Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Well, what a passage we have before us here this evening. As Christ pronounces, declares forgiveness of sins, heals the paralytic, and addresses Uh, the scribes in their inmost being. And this is a passage that is filled with significance as we move forward in Christ's ministry. You know, when we think about Christ as the cornerstone of our salvation, He's the one upon whom we rest. He is the one by whom everything is measured. And this is a passage that is critical in establishing something critical about Christ, and that is that He is God. Christ is God. And what we'll find as we work through this passage is that the power of Jesus' Word, the power of Jesus' Word authenticates His deity. He is God. Nothing changes, but he makes that very evident as uh, he speaks in this passage in multiple, multiple ways. And it's encouraging for believers. Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 4 through 6 as an encouragement to believers. He wrote, as you come to him, speaking of Christ a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a spiritual priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So Peter is establishing and encouraging believers with this reality that by believing in Christ, it's a guarantee of not being, not experiencing any ultimate disappointment or any ultimate shame because you are coming to Christ who is the cornerstone and in Christ as you as you trust his word as you structure your life according to his commands 
you are being built up into a spiritual house, into a holy priesthood to offer sacrifices that are acceptable to God. And what we have before us here in Mark's gospel is Jesus, while he is on earth, establishing that what he says, he says as the God-man. His words are sure. His words are true. His words are powerful. And so for those who are in Christ, who have placed their trust for eternity, who have placed their trust for forgiveness of sins in Christ alone, there will be no disappointment. There will be no shame. Paul says that We've been transferred to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We stand on the Word of Christ. In this passage, as it it establishes Jesus' deity through what He says, it establishes also that Jesus can and indeed forgive sins. Because He is God, He can forgive sins. And what we're going to see in this passage and and in the following passage that we won't be looking at tonight, but this passage emphasizes the fact that Jesus forgives sins, and the next passage in verses 13 through 17 will emphasize that Jesus forgives sinners. And it's a a nuance with a with different with specific instance or or emphases that we'll, I think we'll find encouraging as we take time for each of these passages. Well, let's just quickly consider the context of this passage. This is the first of five conflict events generated by Christ's rising popularity in Galilee and Judea. And what we find in the next five records that Mark gives to us is that there is a question that's raised. And I just want to point those out uh, for us. In this passage, we saw it in verse 7, the scribes questioning in their heart, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And then in the next passage, in verses 13 through 17, at the end of verse 16, again, the scribes of the Pharisees raise the question, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? So in the first passage, there's a question about forgiveness. In the second passage, there's a question about fellowship. And then in verse, verses 18 through 22, there's a question about fasting. And we see that right at the top of the passage in verse 18. Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And then in verses 23 through 28 at the end of the chapter, on the one hand, they were, the, they were upset that, that they, were, they weren't fasting, but now, in verse 24, the Pharisees are upset. Look, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? They're upset that they're eating, right? They just can't win. And that's the nature of self-righteousness. It questions everything, and you can never, never overcome it. It's darkness, blindness, irrational. And then in chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, as the passage comes, or as this section comes to to its climax, the question of the Sabbath is raised again. And this time, Jesus asks the question, and he asks it in verse 4 Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? And they are silent. But the end of this section in verse 6 of chapter 3 records that the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. So this is, that's the ultimate uh, end of this particular section. Mark is, 
is generating uh, the, the tension of conflict as Jesus rises in popularity. The religious leaders are, are dismayed at the ramifications that his ministry will have on uh, their settled institution, and uh, they're, they're concerned about his influence among the people, and so they raise these questions about his authority and about his deity. When we come back now to our passage for this evening in verses 1 through 12, there are two clear emphases that we find. The first is Jesus speaking. In verse 2, at the end of verse 2, as people are crowded into this house, we're told that he was preaching the word to them. And if you have a NASB in your lap or on your phone, it says he was speaking the word to them. And that is actually a slightly better translation, reflecting the word behind uh, the English word being translated there. He was speaking the word to them. And then if you move your eyes to verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. And when Mark says that he said, it's the same word from back in verse 2 where he was preaching. So he speaks to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. And if you look then down in verse 8, as the, as the scribes question Jesus, when he perceives in his spirit that they question within themselves, he said to them, same word behind that English word said. And then at the end of verse 10, after he answers the thoughts of the scribes, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. So all of those words are the, the same word, preaching, said, uh, to the paralytic and what he said to the scribes are the same word uh, in, in the original language. And so there's an emphasis on what Jesus says. And then the other emphasis in this passage is on forgiveness of sins. And we see that in verse 5, of course, son, your sins are forgiven. And then as the scribes question Jesus, who can forgive sin or sins but God alone? And Jesus, of course, repeats uh, their, their thoughts. And then in verse 10, he says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he tells the paralytic to get up and he restores him. So the two emphasis that are immediately apparent in this passage are Jesus speaking and Jesus' authority to forgive sins. And so we're going to look at that, the power of Jesus' word that forgives sins, that authenticates his deity. And, and just as a, as a clear statement concerning the forgiveness of sin, we're, we're going to look at it, uh, aspects of it this evening, but I want to just give us a very clear statement about the forgiveness of sins, and I'm going to take it from our statement of faith in the Second London Baptist Confession of 1689. I think it just brings the, the important elements of what it is to have your sins forgiven in the context of justification. And this just frames what we'll look at this evening. So this is the statement that our church holds to. Those whom God effectually calls, He also freely justifies, not by infusing righteousness into them, but by pardoning their sins, and by accounting and accepting their persons as righteous, not for anything wrought in them or done by them, but for Christ's sake alone." not by imputing faith itself, the act of believing, or any other evangelical obedience to them as their righteousness, 
but by imputing Christ's active obedience unto the whole law and passive obedience in his death for their whole and sole righteousness by faith, which faith they have not of themselves. It is the gift of God. And it's important that we recognize that our sins are pardoned by faith in Christ, a faith that is given to us by God that we can't generate on ourselves, that is a gift of God in and of itself. But as we exercise that gift in Christ, our sins are pardoned, and we are given the full, complete righteousness of Jesus Christ that eternally settles our destiny with gracious fellowship in the very presence of God for all eternity. Right? That's, That's what is at stake when we're talking about the forgiveness of sins. Are my sins so completely forgiven, so set aside by the grace of God that that there is no culpability and there is no liability because of the perfect work of Jesus Christ? And Scripture gives the resounding answer, yes, in Christ there is. And we're going to see that gloriously played out and, and demonstrated in this passage. Well, let's first consider Christ preaching the word of forgiveness. So there's three main points this evening. This is point number one. Christ preaches the word of forgiveness. And we see that in verses one and two. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them or speaking the word to them. Now, obviously, word had spread that Jesus had cleansed the leper and he had to retreat to wilderness places for a while. But now, after an unspecified period of time, he returns to Capernaum, and there's a growing interest in Christ's ministry. Now, not all of it's positive. Uh, In the parallel passage in Luke 5 and verse 17, we're actually told that scribes from all over Galilee and Judea had come as, as part of this large crowd in the house. They were that they had they had their attention had been stirred with what was happening. And they were wanting to see uh, what what was going on, what this teacher was all about. But as the report went out, as people heard that Christ was was at home, probably at Peter's home, the, the house was filled to the point where you couldn't even get to the door because there was such interest in Jesus preaching the word of God. So Christ here is continuing to fulfill that prophetic office and prioritize the verbal ministry. Mark, here at the beginning of Christ's ministry, he keeps repeating, Jesus is preaching, Jesus is teaching, Jesus is speaking the word of God. That's the priority of his ministry is to declare the gospel and declare the need for men to repent and believe the gospel because the kingdom of God is at hand and he's preaching these things and the miracles are substantiating who he is, that he is the son of God, that he is the son of man. Now let's think a little bit about this crowd that is gathered. Where is this? It's Capernaum. And there's great interest in the preaching of the Word of God. But there's a a very important principle to notice from this particular crowd at Capernaum. And that's simply this. Spiritual privilege. We would say the people at Capernaum were quite privileged. They witnessed Jesus doing miracles. They're hearing him preach. They're hearing him speak. This is is privilege. But spiritual privilege does not guarantee spiritual benefit. Spiritual privilege does not guarantee spiritual benefit. 
And, and we know that this is true because even though Capernaum was a city blessed by the presence of Christ himself and many miracles, in Matthew eleven twenty three 23, and 34, Jesus issues a woe, a condemnation on Capernaum because of their unbelief. There's no better preacher than Christ, but unbelief still prevailed in Capernaum. It's not not a matter of, of a problem with the preacher in this case, is it? He's perfect. The sobriety, the sobriety of the spiritual privilege that the people of Capernaum had and the lack of of saving benefit rests in in understanding the depth of unbelief that is native in the unregenerated heart. Spiritual privilege does not guarantee spiritual benefit. Crowds do not make Christians. But at the same time, these people are present and they are coming to hear Christ, and there, there, is, there is good that is being done. And, and although many just came out of interest, what they saw was astounding. They saw Christ pronounce forgiveness and raise up a paralytic. And so on the one hand, there's a warning for us that we, that we not take lightly the spiritual privilege that we have of hearing the Word of God, of having the Word of God so readily available to us. I mean, what, what generation in all the history of the world has had the Word of God so readily available? And we have to be mindful to not take that for granted. And we need the Lord's grace to to humble us, to to be receptive to his truth. But at the same time, as part of that, we also want to be sure that we are where the word of God is being preached. That that is a priority. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his lectures on preaching and preachers, and one of those lectures bemoaned the, the declining uh, priority of, of the services of the church. And, and he made his argument, he made his appeal in this way. He said, go to church at, for, for at the very least, you, you never know what you're going to miss. Right? What if... What if in the preaching of the word, the spirit of God is, is poured out and, and people are, are, are coming to conviction and turning to Christ and you're not there. We don't know what God will do. So at the very least, he's kind of starting at that very b- bottom rung of, of pragmatism. Go to see what will happen when the word is opened. <laughs> And you have that idea here. The people are gathered. There, there's some benefit happening. I mean, Jesus is preaching, but they get to see Jesus do an amazing thing. And folks, there, there, is, there is a great blessing in making our presence, and I'm speaking to the choir because you're here tonight, right? I'm speaking this to encourage you that our presence where the word of God is preached is a, is a matter of conviction and not of convenience. It's a matter of conviction because, because we understand we need to be addressed by the word of God. We need the preaching of the word. We need the instruction of the word. We need the, the instruction of the word with the accountability of God's people around us as we're listening to the word of God. And God does amazing things. Several years ago, I was having a conversation with someone who had some younger children in the house, and, and the person made, made the comment, well, I'm, I'm just not going to, I'm not making them go to church because I, I, I don't want them to grow bitter about being in church. And, 
I kind of want them to come on their own, on, in their own way to church. And I'm thinking, no! <laughs> this is what they need to be under. They need to be under the Word of God. They need their wills confronted with the truth of God's Word. That this, this is the thing that changes people. It's the Word of God preached. Making presence, making our presence a matter of conviction and not of convenience. And I'm, you know, the reality is I'm, we're all a flesh. I am just as much as anyone else in this room. But it's easy, isn't it, sometimes to come to church because what I think, what I, what I, what I might get from it, I just think, well, I, w- I want to go and get stuff in the sense of, you know, I, I just, I want people to, I want a good conversation or, or whatever. Well, one of the, one of the ways to approach our, our coming to and gathering with God's people is to approach it out of a fullness of love and joy from what we have from the Lord. And, and as we walk into our times of fellowship, to, to walk in with an overflow of joy and overabundance of thanksgiving for what God has done and look forward to encouraging whoever it is that God has for us to encourage. And when we, when we gather as God's people, as, as the church of Christ, with, with that anticipation of, of joy in what God has been, has been instructing me personally in the Word, and, and I can't wait to go and talk to God's people, or, or just the anticipation of I've been in the world, and I can't wait to have those spiritual conversations with other people that have been in the world, and to build one another up, right? There's a, there's a great anticipation that comes as we, as we come together and swells in an offering of praise to the Lord as we give attention to his word together. It's a joyous thing. So on the one hand, yes, we need to be careful that we don't take for granted the benefits of what we have. And yet on the other hand, to make it a matter of conviction to be where the word of God is being preached. This is where God works. Not the only place that he works, but it's where he does work among his people. Christ preaches the word of forgiveness. He's speaking the word to them. Well, as the crowd is gathered, we have a group of people isolated and described beginning in verse 3. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men, And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. We've seen that that Christ preaches the word. And we see, secondly, that Christ pardons sinners with his word. Christ pardons sinners with his word. Let's examine the scene that leads to the statement Christ makes. Here are these men bringing this paralytic. He, he, he's incapable of coming to Christ himself. He's laid out on a mat, and so four men are, are carrying him. And they come to the door, and, and the house is so packed full of people, they can't even get through the door to get this very needy man to Christ. But these are resourceful men, and so verse 4, when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof upon him, above him, and made an opening and let him down on the bed. So a house in Israel would have been, had a flat roof with a staircase up to that roof. And you had beams that would go across and, you, and some slabs that would go across those beams and then some clay and grass and whatnot rolled flat on that roof. So to remove the roof, it was a little different than removing a roof. We you don't have to go through shingles and plywood and insulation, but it sounds just as messy. You dig, you're digging through uh, clay and grass and what's been hardened by the sun and then having to take out these slabs and, and make a big enough 
a uh, big enough hole to, to let this bed down uh, through the roof to where Jesus is. So Jesus is teaching, and the, the ceiling is dropping. Um, a, a little bit of a, of a disturbance and a distraction here. We're not given the details, but these men are persistent in finding a means to bring this needy one to the Savior. Like, we can't get into the house and, and it'll be interesting as a side note that throughout Mark, the crowds actually are often an obstacle to getting to Christ. And that's certainly the case here. But they persist in bringing him to the Savior and find a way to bring him down and, and lower him before, before the Savior. And, you know, without making too much of what's happening here, it is certainly an honorable thing to seek to bring people to Christ. And Jesus, Jesus acknowledges that in verse 5 when he says, when, it, when Mark records, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Right? There, there's a responsiveness on Jesus' part to the persistent faith of those who brought the man to Jesus. Now, immediately our minds are saying, well, wait a minute. So, so is the paralytic saved because of the faith of the other people? Right? I mean, because it doesn't say the paralytic believes. It says when Jesus saw the faith of those who brought him, uh, brought him to Jesus. Well, well, I think the thing to keep in mind about this passage, but that it's not addressing, Mark isn't addressing the mechanics of saving faith. Paul does that in Romans. And it's very clear, it's very clear that faith for the forgiveness of sins is an individual faith. Nevertheless, the Lord used the persistence, the kindness, the care, the concern of these men to bring this helpless person to Christ and to put him at their feet, or at, put him at Jesus' feet. And I think that we can certainly make a case by the paralytic's response later in this passage, when Jesus said to him, rise, take up your mat, and go home, that's exactly what he did. So, so he was not void of faith. He believed in Christ as well. But the, but the people who brought him were a means that God used in bringing him to Christ. And I say that too, just to, I think there, there's, a, there's certainly encouragement as we have, all of us have loved ones for whom we are concerned that they would know Christ, that they would know forgiveness of sins. Bring them to the Savior. Pray for them. Tell them of Christ. Exercise whatever means you can legitimately exercise to, to point them to Jesus Christ. The, the faith of these men who brought the paralytic was in Christ, and it was persistent because of the object of their faith, Christ. They knew that that man needed Christ in his condition. And so they bring him and Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. There's profound simplicity in this statement. The act of faith in the lives of those carrying the paralytic to Christ led to his declaration. And we, what, what does it mean to have your sins forgiven? Well, the... the Definition of the word forgive is to release from legal or moral obligation or consequence, to cancel, to remit, to pardon. Son, you have no 
obligation anymore for your sins. Your sins are forgiven. Past, present, future, forgiven, set aside. And the, the way that Jesus addresses him is both a, 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 a term of endearment, son, and a, a term that expresses Jesus' authority. I have the authority to remove the obligation for your sin, to set that aside. The man comes to rest in the presence of Christ and is immediately forgiven of sin. Now, the Jews viewed sickness like this as punishment for sin. And of course, Jesus in John 9 clarifies that that's not always the case. People aren't sick because they're especially bad sinners. But the Jews would have viewed this man in that way. He would have been stigmatized as a sinner because of his helpless condition. So no one would argue with, with the presupposition that his sins did need to be forgiven. The startling thing was that Jesus said, I'm forgiving you your sins. I'm setting them aside. And if we think about this, here, here's a man standing before another man and authoritative, authoritatively declaring that his sins are set aside. Remember what David says about his adultery and murder, right? Sins against other people. But David says, against you and you only have I sinned, and he's addressing God, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. And so the people understand sin is an offense against God. The Jews understood that sin is an offense against God, and so only God can set aside sin. Only God can forgive sin. And here is this man in a crowded house, possibly with remnants of the roof on his clothing and around him, declaring, son, your sins are forgiven. Christ pardons sinners with his word. So we've, we're seeing a progression here. Jesus speaks the word to the crowd and now Jesus speaks to the man directly, your sins are forgiven. There's a, there's a growing intensity of what Jesus is saying. And that provokes a response. So going on now to verse 6. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now, this is a legitimate question to a point. They're right about one thing. God alone is the one who can forgive sins. But what their question raises the opportunity for is for Christ to prove his authority with his word. He's pardoned sin with his word, and now he proves his authority with his word as he speaks to the critics. So we see their private objection, the, these scribes and Pharisees that have gathered from Galilee to assess what is happening with this new teacher. They're questioning, why does he speak like this? He is blaspheming. And, and what, what they're doing in their minds is that they have these two ideas. Here's a man, and he's saying something that only God can say. And, and the word that is, that is behind the word questioning in their minds is, is a word that, that means trying to, trying to harmonize two opinions, trying to take two ideas and, and bring them together. A man who is claiming to forgive sins. Jesus is a man. Jesus claims to forgive sins. Therefore, in their minds, they say, he's a blasphemer because no man can forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. But notice, 
Notice that what is recorded for us is not their words. It's their thoughts. In this passage, the scribes do not actually say one word. Right? Look at verse 6 again. They are questioning in their hearts. And what, what they ultimately are arriving at in their reasoning is that Jesus is guilty of the highest form of blasphemy. In the Jewish mind, there are three levels of blasphemy. It's blasphemy to speak against the law of God. It's blasphemy to speak evil against God. And it's a special category of bless blasphemy to claim equality with God. And that's exactly what they see Jesus doing because it's exactly what he's doing. And so in their minds, they indict the Lord with blasphemy because only God can forgive sins. Again, they're right about that. Listen to Exodus 34, 6 and 7, where when the Lord reveals himself to Moses, he says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. That is what God does, and that is what God alone does. So in their private thoughts, they've raised these private objections. But in verse 8, we have a transition where Christ gives a public demonstration. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? In verse 8, we're told that Jesus fully knew exactly what they were thinking. Perceiving in, their, in his heart. He, he, the word means to know completely. He knew the depth of their hearts. He knew exactly what they were thinking. Why are you questioning these things in your hearts? And what, what Jesus will go on to do is accurately address their internal thoughts. So again, we're, we're, we're demonstrating the fact that what Jesus says demonstrates his deity. His words are demonstrating his deity. And so when, when he addresses the scribes, he says to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. Jesus' words exhibit his omniscience. He knows what's going on in the recesses of the scribes' hearts. He knows what their very thoughts are. He is completely aware. And this becomes critical as Jesus deals with his enemies. His enemies are very self-righteous. And they have built a citadel of self-righteousness. And what we see as Christ begins to address their thoughts, he, he quotes what they're saying, he knows exactly what they're saying, even though they haven't uttered a word, we're seeing that building, building any kind of citadel of self-righteousness is futile before Christ. He is intimately acquainted with the objections of your heart. And, and one day, just like he's exposing what these scribes are thinking, one day he will expose all man's, men's hearts. So better for us now to allow the word of God to expose our heart and to repent 
than to have Christ expose our self-righteousness. We're told in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, and this is such an important passage because, right, who among us is not guilty of self-righteous thinking? We need the Lord to constantly humble us and constantly deal with our self-righteous citadels. But the word of the Lord is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. We need to reckon with these words and be thankful that God's Word, as we open God's Word, as we hear the preaching of God's Word, it's, it's here to penetrate our hearts, to penetrate the depths of our thoughts, and to expose our sin before a holy God, to cast us on our face before God, to repent, and, and to ask for His forgiveness, and, and to, to have the cleansing that comes when we confess our sins. There is no citadel of self-righteousness that will stand before the omniscience of the Son of Man. He knows everything. Jesus answers the question, why, why is he saying these things? He answers the question through his confrontation of the scribe's thoughts. He's, he's already proved that he is God by telling them exactly what they're thinking. But Jesus not only accurately addresses the internal thoughts, because of Jesus' love, because of his mercy, because of his compassion, right? He, he tells them, look, so that you may know, I don't need to do this to establish who I am. I don't, I don't need to do this to, to prove any more to you who I am. I've already told you what you're thinking, but so that you may know that the Son of Man, the one who will one day come in the clouds of glory, the Son of Man has authority here on earth to declare forgiveness of sins. Let, let, me, let me demonstrate to you again the power of my word. He said to the paralytic, rise up. Pick up your bed and go home. And what happened? He rose up and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. The authenticity of the miracle is evident right away. It's a complete and immediate restoration of a man that was incapable of walking. Now he picks up his bed and walks home. And there's a whole crowd of people. Remember at the beginning of the passage, all those people that were pressing into the house you know, he got up and walked, so you, you have this picture almost of like just the, the Red Sea opening up in the house. Everybody just moves aside, and he walks out the door and goes home. Jesus powerfully restores the physical health. Why? Because he is God. He restores immediately and completely with his words. His words carry the necessary power to transform. The scribes asserted that only God could forgive sin, and Jesus proves that he is God and therefore is able to forgive sins. So when Paul says we have redemption and forgiveness of sins in Christ, yes, we do. He is God. He has that authority to set aside our sins. The people, again, of course, are amazed and they glorify God. They, they recognize this is an act of God and they verify the miracle. We never saw anything like this. Well, Jesus began by speaking the word to the crowd. 
He then spoke to the cripple, forgiveness of sins. He spoke to his critics to prove his deity. His word authenticates his deity. His word addresses what only God knows, and his word restores what only God could restore. His word sets aside the guilt of sin. He is God. So as we conclude this evening, just a couple of observations. This passage early in Mark's gospel establishes the weight of Christ's words. And of course, as you think about reading through a gospel, that'll be critical for what follows. Jesus will teach about the kingdom of God in chapter 4. Well, the words that you're reading, those are the words of God. Jesus, by his word, gives life. In John chapter 6, Jesus said, The words that I speak to you, they are spirit, and they are life. And just like Jesus raised the paralytic from his mat, Christ will one day raise the dead from their graves. At his summons, all will rise. Some of you have probably been in a courtroom, and before a, a session begins, people are there, kind of sitting there, maybe talking quietly. And right before the judge enters, a crier gets up and says, All rise! All right, and everyone gets up, and the judge walks in. It's the way it's going to be when Christ comes. Only unimaginably more magnificent. All will rise and the judge will be there. So for anyone who has locked away their soul in a citadel of self-righteousness, be reminded, be warned that your citadel is no protection from the penetrating omniscience of Jesus Christ. He knows your thoughts. You will be exposed. You will be put to shame. But Christ has recorded this so that you may know who He is and bow in repentance and faith for the forgiveness of your sins. And to those in Christ, you will not be put to shame. Christ is the cornerstone of your salvation. Christ has set aside your sins and He took care of paying for all your debt to a holy God when He gave His life on you for, in your place on the cross. And He will, with a word, transform your body to glorified perfection. So rise up and serve your sovereign with joy and with assurance of his love, of his mercy, and of his grace that has been poured out for your sake. Lord Jesus, we thank you tonight that you loved us so much, that you came, that you lived a perfect life, that you died to save your people from their sins. And Lord, we love you. We acknowledge you. We confess that you are the Son of God and that you are the one who forgives sins. We thank you for that precious gift. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for listening from Truth Community Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. You can find church information and other helpful materials at thetruthpulpit.com. This message is copyrighted, all rights reserved.